over me beat unseen wings. This was Winston Churchill writing to his wife, Clementine, from the front lines of the First World War. He was not simply assuring her of his safety. He was declaring his life's philosophy. He had long before come to the conclusion. There has to be a purpose to it all. I believe that I was chosen for a purpose far beyond our simple reasoning. This confidence, this sense of an invisible weaving was the reason that when he became Prime Minister on the eve of the Second World War, he was able to report... I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial. Destiny, purpose, chosen, unseen wings. These are perhaps the only words that serve us well in explaining such a life, such a legendary and magnificent life. And what an enormous life it was. When Winston Churchill was born in 1874, Queen Victoria still reigned, as she would for another 27 years. When Churchill died in 1965, men had already orbited the Earth, walked in space, and launched a probe to the surface of Venus. He lived 90 years, yet he stood astride his age, forcing time and currents of change to serve his vision for his people. So it is that we, in gratitude, remember Winston Churchill. to the battles of his age a psychic energy born of a troubled childhood and a bumptious early life. His beautiful mother was often distracted. His famous father was in decline. Winston's son, Randolph, later wrote that the neglect and lack of interest in him shown by his parents were remarkable, even judged by the standards of the late Victorian and Edwardian days. And so young Winston relied upon the nanny he called Womany, Elizabeth Everest. She nurtured him, she taught him her faith, she told him he was special and called to more than most. It was she, he later wrote, who looked after me and tended all my wants. It was to her I poured out my many troubles. When he died all those decades later, only her photograph was at his side. Thus began the haunting lonely years at boarding schools. Winston wrote mountains of letters home begging his parents to visit. His father would often have business nearly across the street from his son's school and yet refused to see the boy. And so it was for many years. The truth is that school was torture for him. My teachers saw me at once backwards and precocious, reading books beyond my years and yet at the bottom of the form. In time came Harrow and then Sandhurst. 1895 was the turning point. Winston's father died that year, as did Elizabeth Everest, Winston's beloved nanny. Grieving, Young Churchill stepped out into the world. He was eager to rise. By year's end, he had been commissioned in the army, known battle in Cuba, and traveled to the United States. His early military career was dizzying. Ultimately, he would serve in nine different British regiments. Aside from his military duties, he devoted himself to writing. He played polo. He read ravenously. Always, he dreamed of a greater glory. It was during this time that he wrote his only novel. In it, he expressed the philosophy that defined his life. 
Come on now, all you young men all over the world. You have not an hour to lose. You must take your places in life's fighting line. Don't be content with things as they are. Enter upon your inheritance. Accept your responsibilities. Raise the glorious flags again. Advance them upon the new enemies. Don't take no for an answer. Never submit to failure. Do not be fobbed off with mere personal success or acceptance. He was a young man in a hurry. His ambition, drive and fiery personality were already setting the patterns of a lifetime. It was his capture during the Boer War in South Africa that set young Winston before the world. He was taken prisoner while a journalist assigned to British units. Not even the Boers could hold him for long. He escaped, famously worked his way through the African wilderness to freedom, and, owing to a fascinated world press, became a global celebrity. The experience transformed him. He later wrote, I realize with awful force that no exercise of my own feeble wit and strength could save me from my enemies, and that without the assistance of that high power which interferes in the internal sequence of causes and effects, more often than we are always prone to admit, I could never succeed. I prayed long and earnestly for help and guidance. My prayer, as it seems to me, was swiftly and wonderfully answered. Carried aloft by his newfound fame, he eventually entered Parliament. The Churchill the world would come to know and love became stepping to the fore. He made his mistakes, but over time he became something new and refreshing in British politics. It was perhaps his passion his sense of poetry that defined him. He often wept during speeches, particularly when speaking of his beloved England. He was unflinchingly sentimental. Always there was the humor. Or was it more the art of strategic theater? When the cliche familiarity breeds contempt was once used in an argument against him, he thundered. I would like to remind you that without a degree of familiarity, we could not breed anything. When Pygmalion was premiering at His Majesty's Theatre, George Bernard Shaw wired Winston, I'm reserving two tickets for you for my premiere. Come and bring a friend, if you have one. Churchill, who could give as good as he got, wired back. Impossible to be present for the first performance. We'll attend the second, if there is one. Of course, the joke could be on himself. In the course of my life, I have often had to eat my words, and I confess that I have always found it a wholesome diet. So, in earlier days, he ascended. He served in a dozen high positions, from Under Secretary of State for the Colonies to President of the Board of Trade, from First Lord of the Admiralty to Minister of Defence. His political fortunes rose and fell. In the 1930s, he was nearly shunned nationwide for warning of the Nazi peril. Yet it was all preparation. He was walking with destiny on the plains of Sandhurst or on the frontier of India, in a Boer prisoner of war camp or at the front during the First World War. All of it would prepare him. All of it would fashion him for the moment of his greatest service.
Every lion needs his lair, and for Winston Churchill this was Chartwell. It was both haven and welcoming wilderness, both rampart against an encroaching world and home to all that defined the man. was intensely personal to him. He summoned the goldfish by name as he fed them, offered greetings to the trees as though they were familiar parliament friends. Every dog, cat, goat, duck and crow was a beloved part of the menagerie that nurtured his soul. A Chartwell goose was once prepared for family dinner. Winston, presented with a beautifully prepared fowl, turned to his wife and said sadly, You carve him, Clemmy. He was a friend of mine. Clementine was long-suffering, though, and kind. She understood the effect of Chartwell upon her husband. She knew, as well, that eagles must gather if England was to be saved. He once said of Clementine, My most brilliant achievement was my ability to be able to persuade my wife to marry me. Chartwell saw it all. The tears, the rage, the hours of studying, the desperate world situation, the late night pacing of a man stirred by dreams of a better day for Britain, stirred by dreams of fashioning that better day himself. And all of this did prepare him for his greatest moment of service. And the war came. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we stand up to him, all Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. You ask, what is our policy? I can say, it is to wage war by sea, land and air, with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us. To wage war against a monstrous tyranny, never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalogue of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word. It is victory, victory at all costs, victory in spite of all terror, victory however long and hard the road may be, for without victory there is no survival. Let that be realized, no survival for the British Empire, no survival for all that the British Empire has stood for, no survival for the urgent impulse of the ages that mankind will move forward towards its goal. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties, and so bear ourselves that... If the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, 
men will still say, this was their finest hour. came over me beat unseen wings he had said how very much it seemed to be true what is the use of living if it be not to strive for noble causes and to make this muddled world a better place for those who will live in it after we are gone. 